recognition for this invitation. Before I can proceed, I would love to hand over this book to you because a lot of things that I'll be saying, they are written in this book. Okay, thank you. Coming back to the issue on the table, it is true that religion or Christianity, it is no longer what we used to know. In a lot of Christian practices, especially these days, we, we see a lot of Christians diverting from the real gospel and embracing hypocrisy. When we talk about this hypocrisy, we talk about a system that has an occult influence. And also, we can be able to see and trace cult practices. When I refer to occult influence, I am referring to the black magic that's what usually we call it, witchcraft, if I have to be blunt, and uh, manipulation, magic, evil forces. So all those, they form, in my own view, an occult. I remember very well when I came out of the Bible college with my theological training. And uh, as an ordained pastor, I started what we call independent ministry because I did not want to submit under somebody else. I wanted to be a leader, wanted to be a founder, I wanted to be a decision maker. I wanted to be everything in that particular church. So along the way in that environment, I found myself joining the occult. And how did I join the occult? I was introduced into the occult by some of Christian leaders, church leaders, who are pastoring churches. And as a young person who looked up to them for success, because the image they show to the world it's success, material success. That's how we define them. They look prosperous. They look like the ideal ministry that every young person wants to own. And through that association, that is where I was introduced into the occult by traveling to West Africa. West Africa, we went to a place, a, a country called Nigeria. That is where I joined what we call a secret society. Because once you arrive there with the intention of having these supernatural powers, by supernatural powers I'm referring to when you, you pray for people in a church setting and people fall down, manifestation of spirits, which usually it is known as deliverance prophecies, where one is able to tell people, call them by their ID number, call them by their house address, call them also by their residential address or car registration number. So all those practices are within what I call the occult. Now, when we reached there in Nigeria, they advised me that we cannot hand you power but you have to belong in what they call the house. It's a secret society, but it is called a spiritual house or a spiritual family where you have to be initiated for you to be a member. And by being initiated, there are some blood sacrifice that they do where they do it in a traditional manner where you slaughter the goat, you slaughter the chicken as part of the ritual for you to, to be part of them. Then after that, it is when they gave me some of the moti to come and bathe in the church. So when I came back, I came with the head of a pig 
that was meant to attract the crowds. Because part of, of, of this family or part of this occult power is to attract crowd. Your church becomes a mega church without any uh, system or any program that you do like evangelism, soul winning. You don't do those things, but people will keep on flocking to your church. So I buried those head of a pig and I used some of the powers like the oils the soap before I go to the church and also I will kneel down before these altars because I had a room in my house where nobody had an access to that particular room and before I go to the church I will go there I will kneel down and I will talk my talk will be like I want people to believe everything that I say I want when I pray for people they should fall down and I want people to give money. So everything that I talk on those powers is what will manifest in the church hall or in the tent. And this is why I call it hypocrisy. Because this practice is not what Christianity stands for. And when the church begins to grow, you you become the sole leader. You don't have a committee that you account to in that particular ministry. You, you are the bishop or you are the founder and your weight is final. And that is where cult begins. It doesn't start as cult. It starts as a, a genuine church and it goes through a process of occult and the last stage it becomes once it becomes cult, it is where the, the, the church leader is recognized as a spiritual father. Because of even if people, they, they come physically and attend church there physically, but they also belong into a spiritual family. And this spiritual family will make sure that it breaks all your physical and biological relationship with your biological family. You no longer have a good family, whether with your wife, or whether with your kids, or whether with your husband. Your world, it is in this church. And during that time, we had several church programs, because the intention is to keep people in the church. That is the reason why, in most cases, you find people staying in that particular church because they have to be in the church. They have to be far away from the world. The assistant wants them to be locked in that church so that indoctrination can be easy on them. So we had several services. We call them miracle services, breakthrough services, prophecy services, we came with different names so that the lives of our follower could be associated with church. And the, the teaching or the preaching in those churches, we don't preach Christ. I remember very well when I came, they told me and said, when you preach, you should not preach about Christ. You should preach about prosperity. You should preach and promote about witchcraft. People have been troubled by, by witches at night. People have been bewitched by family members and all those kind of preachings. So the preaching is an indoctrination of fear and bondage. Because when you listen to such sermons, when such sermons fill up your mind and your spirit, after church service, you start to be confused and you start wondering and said, last night, indeed, I had a, 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 a dream where people were chasing me. So this means that I've got a spiritual attack. And when people realize that, we open what we call one-on-one -on -one consultation. So this is a system, as I've said, Mr. Chair, that it starts as a church and it goes into a level of acquiring power from witch doctors.
or becoming part of a secret society. And once it becomes part of the secret society, it becomes part of a cult where the church leader has the final weight on every member in the church. And once it becomes an occult, it goes to what we call one-on-one -on -one consultation. The real purpose of one-on-one -on -one consultation, Mr. Chair, is to have a direct influence to your members. Because pulpit is where you use it to advertise your powers or to demonstrate your powers to the crowd. And once people saw that you are able to prophesy people calling them by names, which I will come on that part on how do they do it, people long to have a chat with you on one-on-one -on -one or on a private space. So that is where the one-on-one -on -one platform are always associated to this kind of practices. Now, the pulpit or a Sunday service, it is not a normal service like the churches where we, we come from or our traditional churches as we know them, especially here in South Africa. We know that on a Sunday service, a family will come just to worship the Lord. But in this setting, a Sunday service is a place where the cult leader sat down and he, he brought a strategy to raise money. Because in every service, there has to be a miracle. And after that particular miracle, there has to be money that is raised. Money in which sense? In other churches, they will collect normal offering, as we know it. And after collecting normal offering, they will give a space and say, go and buy the oils which are, are, are being uh, set at a particular corner in the church. They, they open the sales in the house of the Lord. So people are able to go and buy the merchandise in the house of the Lord. And how do they do it? Firstly, they will allow a testimony to come. Somebody will come. Most of them, they've been bought. They, they, they buy this testimony. Others... It is true, they have experienced a certain power, but their testimony has been scripted down. They tell you how to say it. Before you can come and speak direct what comes from your heart, you meet the, uh, the senior prophet or the church leader or the cult leader, and he will tell you on how to say it. A lot of testimonies, a lot of testimonies that we see on these churches, it is not what comes from the heart. It is what has been manipulated and somehow it is very amazing on how they manipulate it. Let's say for example somebody says I've been looking for a job and since I used this oil I did not get a job. Now the one who is a spiritual leader or a spiritual father will be the one putting weights in that person's mouth and say the reason you did not get a job is because of witchcraft in your family. So when you testify there, you should say, the reason I did not get a job was witchcraft. And after I have used the oil, I've got a job. So how they structure their testimony is to promote the power of the cult leader and also the product that has been sold in the church. Then after that, people, they will flock and buy those oils. Once you have bought any material from those churches, you you accept what I call a spiritual covenant. And this is where it's a little bit tricky because it does not happen like a normal covenant or you don't take an oath like what I have done this morning, Mr. Chair. Mm. This one, it happens spiritually. In which sense? In the following sense. Once you, you use, whether it is the water from the church or the oil or the salt, Whatever point of contact that you use from that particular church, it is followed by episodes of dreams. Because these are spiritual matters. It, don't, it does not manifest in the physical world. It starts by dreams. What kind of dreams? You can see yourself in that church. And you see yourself with the pastor giving you instructions. Those are the kind of dreams. The other kind of dreams, it can be sexual dreams, where a member always experiences this continuous kind of dreams. 
other kinds of dreams, they see themselves being underwater. It starts as a dream. Other dreams, they see themselves with the church leader giving them something to eat. And after they have dreamt those kinds of dreams, they go back to the cult leader and say, I have experienced this kind of dream. I need spiritual help. And the cult leader understands very well the interpretation of those dreams and what does it stand for. And you will be able to take them from step one to another step. That is the reason a member of such church, even if they can have a headache, instead of going and buying Panad or Grandpa, they go to the cult leader to consult for a headache. Because their life is being controlled by this church. So anything that happens to them, they have to go and get a clarity from the cult leader. And the cult leader is in a position where he's able to manipulate and do what it pleases. Others have been raped by the same cult leader, but it does not look like rape, Mr. Chair. The reason why it doesn't look like rape, it is because after this individual had this particular dream where he saw herself in an intercourse and intimate space with a church leader, the following day he starts or she starts to develop, this particular person starts to develop certain desires to this cult leader. And as she goes and explains to the cult leader what she has dreamt, the cult leader knows and understands very well that a seed of lust has been deposited in this particular person. So the cult leader will only act on those that he has identified certain signs on them. And that is the reason why their raping process will be continuous. It will be something that happens today, and it, it comes again after a month, it comes. And funny enough, you find it is the victim driving her car, or the victim, the victim moving to the cult leader just to be raped. I am sorry to put it that way, but that is how it is. And these cult leaders, before they, 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 they can do those acts, they groom their people. By grooming, I'm referring to where they make sure that they give you a position that is closer to them. You are, you are able to see their bank balances or bank statements so that they can show you how powerful they are. They are able to even speak with politicians on a loudspeaker where this woman who's been groomed will be listening and talk to high profile people, business people, people of influence. And by so doing, they are making this one who's gonna be a victim of rape to look up to this man as a powerful man. And once the cult leader has made sure that he has groomed this person, and that is where the actual acts begin. The difference between this kind of, 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 of rape or, or abuse with the one that we normally hear on the news or we read, it is they don't go outside the church. These cult leaders uses the church, their church, usually they call it their church because they are the founders of those church, uses their church as a place to pick which one they want to use as a victim. They cannot go outside on the street and do that because they will lose the case. But they make sure that they use those people in the church who have been initiated to believe in them. And these powers, how does it operate? Once you, you join, it is like you are selling your soul. By selling your soul, it means that you allow your body to become an instrument of demons. Because when you start performing those miracles or you, you prophesy to people, it is the demon that you have acquired from that particular place that is in operational upon your life. 
And once that demon is controlling your life, the demon will come and have a particular habit or character upon your life. You are a man of the cloth, but this particular demon pushes you to go to the taverns and drink. After a powerful sermon, you find yourself in the tavern drinking. This is the demon inside of you. This demon makes you to, to have multiple relationships. So you find that there is an imbalance between what you are preaching and what you are living. Because of preaching, you are using your gift and your experience. The Bible says the gift of the Lord, they are without repentance. Some of these leaders, they have charisma. So they use their charisma and experience, but while their character portrays that of a sinner. So there is that imbalance. And once there is that kind of imbalance, followers of that particular church will also begin to behave like their leader. We normally call it transference of spirits. But it, it has to do with more of grooming, if we have to be literal. Because of the pastor will be close to the worship team members. In most of the time, they are women. And as he's part of them, he starts to show them his private life. And by so doing, he is grooming them to live a sinful life. And in the worst case scenario, that is where you find a, a one man who is sleeping with five women who are part of the worshiping team in the same room at the same time. And when such things happen, they don't talk about it because they say this is our deity, it's our spiritual father. And when they do those things, they twist the word of God. And these young people, they don't question because they've realized this is a man of power who is able to talk with politicians, who is able to talk with influential people. So whatever he says, it means we have to follow it. Thank you, Mr. Chair. As I indicated in the beginning, uh, this is an educational process. For us as a commission to understand what we are dealing with and the challenge that um, congregants are facing, the challenge that we also face in dealing with some of the complaints that come our way, how to deal with them issue of spiritual being. How does it happen? Now, um, you have le listened very carefully from the articulation of uh, Apostle uh, Makado, making very clear what is actually happening uh, in that environment. Because it was a murky situation, very difficult to analyze, very difficult, difficult to uncover the, 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 the underlying causes and and things like that. And, and so um, this morning we are privileged to listen to this. And I might also say that the apostle comes from the belly of the beast. He is not, he is not the, saying what they, what he heard. He comes from the belly of the beast. When he said, I brought a, a head of a pig, he didn't say they brought a head of a pig. He said, I brought it, and I planted it in my, in my, in my church. Um, so you have here politics, religion, money, and sex, all in it interwoven. Okay? When you talk about the influence, you're talking about political influence. Because you're at a high level where everybody sees you as a leader. And as a leader who has a multitude of people who are follow, following him or her. But they forget, how did you get this 
crowd following you is because of the elements which uh, the Apostle has rightly explained to us. Now, I want you to, uh, in, in, it's a conversation, uh, it's, it's a real conversation, it's uh, educational here, um, and, and, and if possible, we want South Africa to understand, to help us deal with the scale. And this morning I was being interviewed, I said, uh, um, or some of the words, if women and children can't find solace and protection in the church, why would they care? Yeah? If they are chased in communities, in their houses, in the streets, if they can't find a place of hope, a place of care in the church, what would they get? Huh? And this is the question South Africans must begin to raise. Okay? Over to you, Commissioner Mutter. Okay. Thank you for the for what you've given us so far. I must say it's very enlightening. Um, I just want to ask you, I noticed in the beginning when you first started your church, your first reaction on leaving um, Bible College was to come out from authority and come out from accountability. And I've noticed with most of uh, the institutions that we've spoken to um, where we have found potential problems like the seven angels and all those sort of things, that seems to be what is lacking, that, that level of accountability, that accountability to somebody else. Would you say that is one of the core reasons for the manifestation of what we see? Question number one. Question number two. Um, when you joined the secret society, how do they influence you? And what is your responsibility towards the secret society, obviously, for them having uh, brought you into this fold, as you, as you might call it? And were you made aware of other people within South Africa that were also part of this society? All right, can I answer? Yeah. All right. Thank you so much for the two questions. The question about accountability. I would say, as we know that, uh, Every, every church has to belong into a body. But once you start to, to move away from a body and you start to become a body by, by yourselves, it shows that you don't want to be accountable. In my instead, I, I graduated and I was ordained by the Apostolic Faith Mission. But after my ordination, I started what is called independent ministry. Now, independent ministry did not ordain me, but I was a pastor without a license because my license was supposed to serve in the Apostolic Faith Mission. So what is happening is that we have people who rush to the Bible College just to get the license, but the ministry where they are now serving has nothing to do with that license. It is like you go and you get a code 10 license, but you come and you drive a code 14 vehicle. So I was operating independent without a license because my license, uh, I was supposed to serve in the Apostle of Faith Mission. So I served there without the license and without accountability. And as I was serving there, I, you know, power, Power, I, I want the correct way, that power is dangerous because of it grows in you. Once you start preaching, there is no tempting place like the pulpit. Once you start standing there, people clapping hands for you when you preach, you start to develop more hunger for power. So I was not satisfied with the gift that I had of preaching or the message that I had. I wanted more power. And more power, I, 
I knew that the Bible college could not offer me this particular thing. So I had to look for those who are doing this. And those are people who have been in the ministry. So that is where I diverted and I never went back to the Apostolic Faith Mission by then. Because I knew that they won't accept these practices. So I stayed with the independent ministry so that I can be free to do anything. So when a person begins uh, the issue of being independent, it means that they are running away from accountability. So that is the core reason, I can say in a simple sentence. Coming back to the issue of the secret society. It does not mean that it's only in Nigeria where you have a secret society. The, the word secret is universal and it means something that is hidden. Once you have a group of people who know a particular truth and, without, and, and they don't want to expose that particular truth, then it's a secret. It's a secret group. So the secret society in this instance is a people who use witchcraft powers and they are aware this is witchcraft powers, but they hide it from their followers. They preach to their followers and say, don't go to traditional doctors and consult. Why them are clients there? And some of them, they are not just clients. Some of them, they, they've been initiated as traditional doctors. So they, they, they are traditional doctors and also they are pastors, charismatic pastors. So this is where we call it a secret society because they don't reveal their true identity. We just see them as men of the cloth. Now this group of people, especially the one that I belong to, you must have a sign to show that you belong to. They made a sign on my body, on my left hand. They made these three stripes here. These are the three stripes where they said, with these stripes, you will be able to see other members of this house, other pastors in your country. If you look at their left hand, others, they've got these three stripes. It's a sign. And once you meet these particular people, you don't greet them with your uh, right hand. You greet with the left hand because you belong in the same spiritual family. So they, they start to influence your behavior. They tell you what you must not eat. They tell you how to live your life. They even tell you that the money that you make, you must send it back to them. So your life, you are no longer in control of your life. You are in control of the demons that you have acquired, and you are in control of the society that is ruling your life. And if you want to come out, they will tell you, and say, if you want to come out, we will kill you, you will die. And this secret society does not only uh, have pastors. You know, in, in our towns, we have these ones who are called uh, Dr. Mama, or these ones who put their posters there. Those are part of the cult. They work together because of, it's either you do it traditionally, or you do it via a church where you disguise as a prophet. Now, these ones who are called Dr. Mam, they are the ones if you, you will have any problem, you take the names of your church member, then you give it to this one, who will do a consultation to the spirits during the week, and he will give you what we call a feedback. And on Sunday, you have a data of what is called prophecy. When you go to your pulpit, already you know that Norma has a problem because of Dr. Mama has consulted the, the spirit. So you stand there and you give out a prophecy that has a, a network of all these other uh, 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 role players who are not Christians. So in a nutshell, I can say leaders who are part of the secret society are controlled by the secret society. In, in the worst case scenario, they even tell you that uh, your church members have to change and put on a uniform. And once you come to the church, you will say, God has spoken to me. And it is not God. It is the God of the society. Thank you. Thank you, uh, <coughs> Thank you very much. Uh, previously, when we had other... Uh, people testifying here, they spoke of the power that they 
went to get in Benin, in, um, in West Africa. And uh, one, I think, even spoke of it as voodoo. So I was wondering whether the West African, the Nigerian experience is the same as the experience in, of voodoo in Benin. The second question is, uh, when you look at Southern Africa, South Africa especially, there is a lot of uh, people are really attracted to these churches, to the, uh, what you call the occult. And I just wondered if perhaps there is a difference between the people in South Africa as opposed to the people in other parts of the African continent when it comes to being attracted to this. Or what is it about us that makes us so susceptible to this type of uh, uh, churches that we go in groves, we even uh, cross the border and go and worship in Nigeria, for instance, as has happened in the past. Then I wanted to hear from you what you see as the intersection between witchcraft and uh, the work of traditional healers because I am um, I'm, I'm wondering how, 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 you, how you see that. I was going to ask you about also about whether there is a convention, whether there is a spirit society in South Africa where the people like yourself who have been initiated into this uh, uh, have got a kind of uh, fraternal relationship with others, but you already answered that because you spoke of the three stripes where people can recognize each other. So I will let that one slide. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Langa, for these three important questions. I will start with the issue of powers, where the Commissioner asked about the voodoo or what kind of powers are, are being used in these churches. There are different kinds of powers. In this book, The Church Mafia, I speak about how I traveled. I did not go only to Nigeria. I also went to Congo, Democratic Republic of Congo where I was initiated and I saw what is called Mamba Mundu. That is a half crocodile and a half human being. Mm -hmm. And I saw it with my eyes. I was not drunk. I was not under any influence. I saw it, it came. We went to the river during the night. It was a full moon. The light that was there was from the moon. So we went in that river in an island called Kongolo, in DRC, an island called Kongolo. And when we went there, the man who was going to initiate me, they spoke French there. So the one who was interpreting for me is the one who took me there. So we went in, into the water and they did some incantation. And after doing some incantation, this being, it came as you are in the water, you are able to see during the night, it's quiet. You are able to see some movement from a distance. The water was just splashing. There was a sound and it took my concentration. I saw it was coming. I did not know what it was, but they told me that they are going to call their God, which is half human being and half crocodile. This thing came with a very powerful speed. You know, if a, a person is swimming as a human being, you are able to know this one is a human being by the speed. But this one, it was an extreme speed. It was coming and it came behind me at my back. It helped me here. I'm talking something that I saw it. Now, I, I, I could sense that it, it was big. 
and the cloth and the hand that touched me here, it was not of a human being. It baptized me as in putting me in the water, and after that it gave me something like an egg, because I could not look at it because I was afraid. It gave me something like an egg, then I had to swallow the egg with the shell. Then from then the man did some incantation, then it went away. The way it was breathing, I, I could tell it is not a human being. As they gave me the, uh, the description, they said it's a half human being and half crocodile. And the end, I could see this one, it was more of a lizard with nails. Now, after that episode, I had the encounter where I dreamt, it was a vision, this one, where I dreamt being underwater and being given instruction. So there is a physical manifestation that is also connected to dreams. So when a person has dreams, they are connected to the physical manifestation. So coming back to the uh, question of power, as I've said, these church leaders, uh, Commissioner Nanga, they acquire different kinds of powers. The voodoo power, it's, it's one of the powers. And that is the reason why these days, in most of these mega churches, on their pulpits, you find that they have, they call it decoration, but it's not decoration. They put fruits. You know, the, when you worship voodoo, you can do your own research. They put fruits on the particular god, where the god is. There must be those fruits as a sign of a sacrifice. So on this pulpit, they are very beautiful, but they are surrounded with fruits. So that is a sign to show and say, on that pulpit, it is an altar of a voodoo. Because fruits in the church has nothing to do with the church. So those fruits, they, they are a sign that we have sacrificed, we are giving you these fruits. And after the service, they can say, everyone come and pick up the apples. And people, they will go and pick up those apples. They start to eat. But they don't know that those fruits there, they've been sacrificed to the God, which is voodoo. And it does not end there. Others, they even go to an extent of using what we call marine spirit, which is called the water spirit. Water spirit has a, a, a background where you can trace it also in the Bible. It comes a long way. Now, this water spirit, number one, the church where your church is, it must be next to the water. There must be a river next to the water where you are able to take people for what we call baptism. But this is not the same baptism that Jesus encountered. This is a baptism into an into an occult. It's more of initiation. So they use the water or the river that is next to the water or they can even have a, a swimming pool in the church. If they have a swimming pool in the church, all members will have to via through that water. If they don't have a swimming pool in the church, they can make a, a service, a special service, where the pastor will say, I'm coming to wash your feet. Out of the blue, the pastor says, I just, God spoke to me that I can wash your feet. And every member in the church will take off their shoes because this is the marine kingdom that wants to influence the church. So every member of the church has to via through that particular water. So the pastor will come and wash you. He will take his time. He's a busy man, but he has to make sure that he does that by himself with his own hands. You bank your feet. That is what we call the uh, marine powers. In other instances, they, they use what they call do as I say. In my instance, they gave me a small horn. It was called Ashe. It's a Nigerian name. It's called Ashe. Now, with that horn that they gave me, they said before I could talk, I had to wrap that uh, particular uh, uh, muti on my tongue before I go to the pulpit. So they, they collect a lot of, of powers. Others, they even bury uh, uh, life, 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 life cows, life animals in the church. 
so that uh, their church can remain as powerful as they want it to be. So attending such churches, it, it makes church members to be victims of these kind of powers. You go to one building, but you've got more than 20 powers and you are not aware. Yet you are the one shouting the name of Jesus while you have been possessed by many powers in that particular church. And these powers, they work for one purpose, to bring the crowd. All they want is numbers. So they do anything that they can for these powers. And all these powers, as I have said earlier on, they've got their own characteristics. Some of the powers, they, they want blood sacrifice. That is the reason other members will die. They can be a stampede in that hall. They can be a stampede in that crusade. But life has to be lost in that particular environment. Others who are close and who've got, let's say, a, a particular gift. You can be a musician who has been loved by people in that church. And you are close to the pastor. As time goes on, the musician can have an accident. So they cause some of the members to experience an uh, untimely death. Because those will be part of the sacrifice that these powers are looking for. I'm coming to the issue of South Africans. If we are we the only one who are being these victims? When I went to Nigeria, I... I I was shocked to see how the world, that's especially the religious world, it is that side. People are practicing occult openly, Mr. Chen. In Nigeria, it's not something that people can hide it. And uh, uh, it was my first time to see a lot of churches, mega churches, where there is a lot of following, but they don't believe in Christ. Remember, I'm from South Africa, I'm from a Bible college. Even if I was looking for power, but my world says, if there is witchcraft, everybody hides. We don't talk about witchcraft. But in that country, people are proud to say, I'm the best witch here, and I can do and undo. That's what they love saying. I can do and undo. I can open and close. <laughs> so, in South Africa, I think the lack of, of awareness, because of these people, they hide through the gospel. They bring the gospel as a, a point of attraction while they know that they are practicing these particular practices. So in South Africa, the lack of knowledge, most of South Africans, they were like me before I went to Nigeria. They did not believe that you can use witchcraft in the church. But my experience has taught me that it is possible to have an occult priest who is a witch and who is uh, uh, preaching on a Sunday at the same time because of what they say, it is not what they do. Privately, they are occult priests and on Sunday, they stand as the men of God. So, South Africans, we, we are at risk because of these people, not only foreigners, this day it is not foreigners, even, even our own brothers here in South Africa, they are, they are joining this train, they are moving here, going out, going to acquire power, and once they have given you power, it's usually a snake. This is a snake that grows, and when it grows, you must have spiritual sons that will be able to impart the same power they've given to you to others. So a lot of pastors, they go there, they collect these snakes from Nigeria, they bring it here to South Africa, it makes them uh, prosperous, famous, and here is a young pastor from the Bible College, like I was at that particular time. I looked to this pastor, I joined him, he gives me part of the snake, and he also goes and becomes a spiritual father. And you will target somebody else. And the other painful part, Mr. Chair and uh, the Commission, it is that once you collect these powers from this country, you must make an oath that through you, other members of the secret cult, they will come to South Africa. So once you are successful using those powers, you will go back 
and connect other members who are struggling in that village and you bring them here to South Africa and you open a branch. You give them money, you do everything, they need a branch. And what happens? South Africans, they flock there and they call another one. They come. So this, it becomes a chain. And all these foreign, most of these foreigners, they work with our local pastors. They work with people who are in high position of influence, pastoral fraternity. Most of those people in, in those top uh, uh, position, they work with them. But it looks as if they are fighting. When you look at them, it's like, I know, they are fighting. But they know that they are working together. So, in answering the second question, I will say, South Africans, we become victims because we don't know what is occult. South Africans, we don't believe that witchcraft can be practiced in the church. Coming to the issue of the difference between the witchcraft and the traditional doctors. I would say you can find witchcraft practice in the church done by a man of the cloth. You can find witchcraft in a traditional doctor done by a traditional doctor. So in my own understanding, witchcraft is when you use powers for evil use or for evil purposes. That is witchcraft. Traditional doctors are people who use traditional ways, ancient ways, ancestral practices to do their practices. But even in that particular group, you can find those who don't sleep at night and they do their own things. And when you come to the house of the Lord, it is a, a modified witchcraft practice where one is given a bottle of oil and they will tell you, this oil is do as I say, you must pour it in the foot of your husband. Just because of it has a sticker of your church and it's written from Jerusalem. Then we say this is not witchcraft, but it is the same practice. Some of the women, they, they've been told that during the night, around 12 o'clock, open that oil, speak and call your husband wherever he is. So those are witchcraft practices in the church. Thank you, sir. It's a spirit realm, 
where your spirit that you talk to, mm. you are washed using the most high, mm. you know, space and praying and so forth and so forth. Mm. So I'm giving already two spirits that we use as marine spirit or water spirit that we, we say. Mm. What will be the differentiation in your understanding with what you are alluding, maybe from the West Africa? The other one is terms that we use. In South Africa, as, as, as African, uh, Abangoma and so forth, we do not have terms that call Dr. Mama. I, sh I think you should know that. We are just called Abangoma mm -hmm. and Uko, Uko, Ukuru, and so forth. We may not necessarily understand what makes someone to be Goko Mama. We, mm -hmm. It's not in our space, we do not. Mm -hmm. However, it's, it is in South Africa, yes. it's here. And it, it, it most of the time find a clash between the South Africans here with our brothers that come from outside mm -hmm. that may be deemed traditional healers, which as your definition you say, it may not be the same as our definition here mm -hmm. on healers, Isangoma, Abangoma, and so forth. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm going to, to the dream provocation and um, control, manipulation. Mm -hmm. In the same space, you know, I, I'm just wondering to say how far would one manipulate one's dream? Because when we, we, we go in the initiation, you go, depending on your dreams mm -hmm. as someone, mm -hmm. your vision, your, some things that you hear that you see other people cannot see, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. So different from the space where you find yourself. Okay, I think in, my, in the back of my mind is the question of the witchcraft itself. Because if you look in South Africa, you've got a community that identifies themselves. It's a white community as witches, which is it's a religion that practices in South Africa. As you speak, they might be listening. Majority you find them in Cape Town, Johannesburg has some, which they are practicing, it's their practice as witches or pagan or Wicca, that's yes. what they call it. Yes. And they're practicing that it's, it's their right to practice, yes. which I may not necessarily go into deep because I'm not, I don't understand what to say. However, as they come to the commission that we are here and we are practicing, and you are alluding that they are with, using the spirit of witchcraft, but what they are understanding, it's not is what you're saying. Yes. That's labeling, using the same language as they use, mm -hmm. which might be different. Family as a primary institution has collapsed mm. as we speak in South Africa. Faced with divorce, with a lot of things, abuses, sexual abuses, which we do not know such a magnitude, you know, epidemic, if I would say, because it's out of hand, it's coming from. How do you see us if there's any a chance of restoring this institution of a family? If if there is a chance of ensuring you know, that it can be done. Okay. Um, maybe before you answer, I'm, I just want to finish check um, the explanation of the commission. Because I wanted to find out how you can help us understand the situation. Because uh, you have defined So, so a witch is at variance with the court. Um, so you don't define witch in terms of the court. It is always in terms of the bad. So the spirit the commissioner is talking about, I suppose, is the spirit of the good mother. The spirit that you are talking about, the spirit summons the initiation, it's always about yes. building community. Yes. Yes. yes, yes. But I also touched on the issue of the witch itself, because to say there's a community in South Africa that uses that word as witch, they are witches. It's a white majority of white communities. And they're practicing it. Not in a bad way, but I'm not sure whether in in a in a in a in a bad way, but yeah. It is something that yeah. it's there because I'm wary of the name that we may use and they come to say, but you you claim that we are 
as Richie said, we know that. You know, how do we handle that, knowing that we've got a community that say clearly, what you talk about, it's not something to do with, we've got nothing to do with this. I think we will, so to, sorry. We, will, we will have to invite them to explain to us what's the announcement for them. Mm -hmm. For now, we take a definition of the witch as you say it. Mm -hmm. But okay. you only have to come and tell us mm -hmm. what if, what you did with the variances. Mm -hmm. Because that will help us to define the differences. Okay. Okay? Thank okay. You. All right. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair, for giving clarity and also thank you for the question, Commissioner Mbele. When coming to my own understanding or definition about the, the water spirits, looking into a context where we, we have our own, our own people who go through initiation, maybe they were sick and they, they had to go through that road and after the initiation they are, they are healed. It, it shows that the process that has been taken has a spiritual influence. And spiritual influence is something that is above our human ability, something that the doctors could not do, but here they are, they are healed. But when I refer to the, the, the water spirits, remember the Bible says those shall not worship any other God. It, being, it means even the elements that are created by God, we cannot worship them. But when we talk about water spirits, it is when you start bowing down to that water, that river, putting candles there, and asking life or blessings from that particular river. Remember, there are elements. I think uh, uh, Commissioner Mbele can relate with me on this. When I was a false prophet by then, I had even traditional people coming to me for, for strength. I would, I would give them strength. I had bishops of, of churches that I would give them strength. And also I was at a position where uh, I, was, I was giving charismatic leaders uh, powers to prophesy. So I was at a particular position of understanding deep the spiritual things. So there are elements, the water, the fire, the air. That is the reason uh, when a person says that they use those elements, whether it's in burning candles or in, the, the, the content is the element. So here we are talking about the, the element of water, which one goes there and asks for forgiveness. The energy that comes there, you start worshipping it. And that is what we call it a marine spirit. It has a particular spirit which I cannot define. In my instinct, I was, I was fortunate enough to even encounter this particular thing. So, so in this instant, it is when you know with your heart that I am not using this water, but I am worshipping this water. So, worshipping the element, that is where it becomes a marine kingdom. Because of, we can't run away from the fact that we need this element as part of our, of our body, because we need water to drink, and we, we've got heat in our body. We need air to breathe. We, we also depend on this particular element. But there are those who are called spiritualists. This spiritualist, uh, my experience in the West Africa, you know, in, here in South Africa, you've got uh, people who are able to throw the bones down and they interpret the bones. But there, it's very different. You find a man seated there and the men will, will just look at you. Those are spiritualists. Others, they put on the long rope, the dress with red or different colors. And you sit down there, they take water, they pour it there, and they're able to, to show you uh, or, or to tell you your future or your past experience. So these are spiritualists who use water as a religion. Whatever they do, they go to that particular water and they are not worshipping, uh, I mean, they are worshipping the spirit from that particular water. So uh, the marine spirit, it is when a particular church worships water, whether it's publicly or privately. Now, when coming to what we call faith healing, this is a very interesting question. And uh, I, I hope South African will also have a, a clarity on this one. Because it is the, 
the searching for healing that makes people to go to this church. This church are associated with healing. But as a spiritual person who, who, who understands, maybe in the context of the commissioner, who understands healing in their own context, will know that healing can still take place in different forms. Healing can still take place whether you use panado, it's healing at the end of the day, whether you go through that process here, Uktwasa, the person will tell you that I am healed. So healing can take place in different ways. So the faith healing that has been practiced in these churches, it is not a Christian healing. The reason why I'm saying it is not a Christian healing, it is because these people, they use different forms of religion combined in one umbrella. There is what we call the Riki. Riki is energy. Be able to transfer energy using your own hand. So if you look at your television, you look at how these people perform. They make you to stand there. They put their hand on your forehead. That is Riki. And they, they put it for a while. They start shaking it like it's vibrating. And they move as they move it. Those are Riki practices. So you are able to see different forms of, of other religion or spiritual elements that has been embraced or under one umbrella and they say it's Christianity. So the, the faith healing, it, it comes in different ways. Others have been given water. Others are given different things. Others, they give you what they call uh, instruction. In Susuti Taero. You must go and do one, two, three, one, two, three. So at the end of the day, you see healing. So healing in this uh, uh, churches, they are not Christian based. They, they do what other, they, they adopted what other religion, traditional, they come and steal and they go to Hindu, they steal, they go to other religion and they make their own religion. When coming to the issue of the tents, once you join this secret society, you, you are given a name. And in this book, I have spoken about the name that they gave me, which was called Katakata. That is the reason a lot of uh, members of secret cults, they don't use their names which appear on the ID number. When there's a pastor, he will start coming with new names. Because you have to use names that are associated with the particular demon. Or a name that will make, whosoever will mention that name will be under your spell. So the name that I was given, I was instructed that in the posters or the flyers that I should distribute, I should put that particular name. So that whosoever touches and calls that name will start believing. It's a spiritual connection. So that is the reason why there will be a clash between the South African traditional doctors who've got their own tents, and here we are, we've got people who come with names we don't understand. And they are all over. And even the church leaders have adopted this particular name. We no longer have pastors. We no longer have uh, 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 titles that they are from the Bible. These days we've got uh, forensic, whosoever. We've got bazooka, whosoever. We've got ganda, ganda. So, so you see that there are particular names that are associated to this particular cult. So it is in connection with the cult, the issue of the names. Coming to the issue of the dream or manipulation, <coughs> manipulation. I will go back to the issue of the healing because this is how it happens. They, they make those who are sick to stand there and they will say, look at me in the eye. The pastor will look at the, the one who's sick direct in the eye for some time and you wonder what is happening. Remember, the eye is a, the window to the soul. So there is a transference of that particular spirit from the pastor into this person's eye. For some time, as the pastor is looking into the eye of this person, he will start to control. So there's what we call mind transference, thought transference. They control it from your thoughts. Others, they can hear you, they can hear the voice of the pastor telling you to do whatever they want you to do. So the thought transference does not only end in that church. You can be home. You can be wheresoever. The pastor, 
That is where witchcraft comes, the term witchcraft. Using or manipulating powers for personal gain or for evil. So they use the mind control or calling of the soul. During the night, they can call your soul and give you instructions. They can say, we want you so and so to come and give 10,000 tomorrow. Then, as you are seated, you just feel normal. I need to give my pastor money. Where does it come? It comes from the thought. Where does the thought come? It comes from the thought transference. That is witchcraft. So these people are able to send certain thoughts to their victims. So the issue of the dream and also the mind manipulation, it comes from there. But it does not end there. Maybe the, the, the commissioner will also uh, help me on this one. Because when I was a false prophet, I remember I, they taught me this technique where you are able to take what you call African potato. This African potato. If you take African potato, you boil it. You boil it and it becomes more like brown. You take that water, you give it to somebody else. And after drinking that water, the person will, I can't say they hallucinate, but they are on a certain trance. And it is like a, a spiritual encounter where you are able to see things that normal people they don't see. That is African potato. Now, I used to take the African potato, then I would cook it, mix it with porridge and give it to people to eat. That is the reason churches, most of these cult churches, they have what we call the eating. Eating is involved because most of the mutis are involved in the eating. There's something that has been mixed. This is not a normal eating where they invite a catering company, Mr. Chair. Mm. It is an eating that the, the prophet has brought his oil and said pour it there so that members of my church can eat. This is an eating where the prophet has brought water and said mix it there so that whosoever eat will be connected to the church. So during that time I will mix porridge, mix with this water, give it to people. People they will eat as porridge but it will be sour. As they eat it, they go to these trends. Most of the traditional doctors, they say Obana Spili. It is like if Obata Obana Manaba how. Or if you want to see who is be bewitching you. So they use this road. When they give you something, then they put a white cloth and say, you must just sit there. And out of the sudden, you start to see something like a movie. You start to see your grandmother. So all those is hallucination. So the issue of the dreams, mind control, it is a built up process. You don't just dream. There are things that has been put together for you to reach that level where you dream. And those dreams are manipulated because there is an element of witchcraft in those dreams. I will come to the issue of the family. It is very sad where you see churches are being responsible to cause divorce these days. Church leaders are mentioned in a lot of divorce experiences. Why am I saying this? A lot of women who attend church and their husband, they don't attend church. They go to the church, they go to one-on-one -on -one consultation, and when they go to one-on-one -on -one consultation, they speak because they believe the pastor will help them. They even speak on how they are not satisfied in the bedroom. They are talking to another man. Another man who has more influence on their life. And where does it end? It, it ends in tears where the woman becomes the victim of abuse. We've got instances where these so-called spiritual leaders or spiritual fathers or papa, once there's that title, you should be conscious and say, here yes, somebody has more power than the husband at home. Because the papa or the spiritual father is the one who will give instruction on when you should have or, or, or on where you should be intimate with your partner because the papa controls everything so the only way to restore families it is when we go back to the word of god when we we teach people 
that a pastor does not have final authority in your marriage. When God created Adam and Eve, he never created a pastor next to them to control their marriage. So family, we, we need to restore or we need to teach women to respect their husbands at all. Even if their husbands are not working, Mr. Chair. Women should stop talking the weaknesses of their husband to another man who's not even faithful to their wife. Because a lot of these church leaders, they've got affairs. So you come, you bring you, your own family issue to another man who is failing. Some of these leaders, they have divorced a uh, 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 second time, third time. And some of them, they're even on a process of divorce as we speak. But look at the women who are going for marriage counseling to such leaders. So we need to re-educate uh, uh, women, empower women, that women, we know that we've got issues, but don't take your issues to your spiritual leader. Women should come back, have a conversation, have a society, not secret society, but a, a, a society where they are able to help one another. Women should cancel women. And in a case where we have a marriage counseling, we need professionals. Because these days it seems as if when you are a pastor, you've got a ticket and an advantage to become a marriage counselor, a financial advisor, all these things without a, a formal training. So you find a young man here, maybe of my age, seated doing counseling to an older woman who is talking deep and sexual content. And what happens in that? It will always create an uncomfortable environment. So we need to understand and say, pastors, they should do marriage counseling. They should be trained because they will be dealing with families. It is not knowing the scriptures or the Bible only that makes you a qualified marriage counselor. So we need professionalism. We need to educate the members of the church that they need to acquire professional help. For the fact that the pastor speaks in tongues does not make him a qualified marriage officer or counselor. I think I have answered the commission. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Chairperson. I just want to check with you. No. I, I, I have observed and you have also said that once people become members of the churches, they are somehow separated from their biological relatives. Why is this important to, 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 to the church leaders? And number two, it's whether these rituals that are performed in order to give the, uh, the religious leader powers, are they sustainable? They expire. And what happens to the congregation if the leader dies? Thank you so much. I will start with the first one about separating biological family and establishing what they call spiritual family. Cult churches or these practices of this strange phenomenon that we are, we are faced with, they want control of a human being. That's what they want, full control. And full control, it means that they want to be the only voice that speaks over your life. So they will separate you, whether by prophecy, they will tell you that your 
grandmother is the one behind your failures. Trying to separate you from your biological family. They will separate you from your biological family by saying that using scriptures, twisting scriptures, like we are not of this world. You know, they just take a portion of scripture and you start to see your family as your enemy. And once they have separated you, you become lonely and they are able to give you the care. Others, they tell you, move from where you stay, you must come and stay at the church premises. And once you stay at the church premises, they become your provider, they give you food, they give you clothes, and by giving you, you see them as a caring people. You trust them with your life. And the other reason is that what they've separated you from family is that whatever that they will do to you, you won't be able to share with anybody because you are just alone. You came here looking for help and they are uh, abusing you and you can't share this. And others, it starts like this. They give you a prophecy and say, don't tell anybody this. They make appointment and say, don't tell even your husband about our appointment. So they try to cut away all people who are closer to you or who can be a shield to you. Remember, family is a shield. We are protected by people who are closer to us. So taking away the family, they are making you uh, to be alone. And they encourage you of what we call spiritual family. It goes back to the term of spiritual mother, spiritual father. Because you now belong into a family that you are not related by logic and but you can uh, 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 you can stand and say this is my father and you reject your biological father we sit next to you you take care of your spiritual father you don't take care of your biological father so they do that so that they can win and control your life now the rituals there are different types of rituals that are, are used and they are sustainable in different ways. There are rituals where you have to slaughter a cow, it needs blood. You have to uh, slaughter a, a, a cow or a goat or a chicken. You split that particular uh, blood on those altars. Remember, blood is life. Once you, you slaughter a blood, on those, there is a pain that goes in the slaughtering process. And from then, the blood, which is life of that particular animal, is being given to this altar. So by slaughtering, you are giving life to this particular spirit. There are other rituals where they use human cements, whether or human fluids whether they come through a sexual act or whether they tell you to cut your hair or whether they tell you to cut your nails they they use human uh, fluids for rituals that is the reason why you will hear of an instance where a pastor or a church leader can sleep with about seven women unprotected why it is because what is needed is those human fluids that are taken to the altars. And once they are taken to the altars, the victims, the victims are the ones who suffer because their lives now start to struggle as the church leader becomes more prosperous. And they maintain it through the very same act. And the question was asked and said, if a church leader dies, what happens? If those powers are not maintained, check, it's a problem. Usually, if a leader is about to die, they have to go back to the house where the leader acquired power and there is a transference. They must do that ritual. But let's say the leader dies and they don't know what is happening, but they know that the father was just using things. What will happen, Mr. Chair, is that 
One from the family to protect the secret of the family will be appointed to be a church leader without a calling or without a gift. And as a church leader, you will, you will be protecting the idol of the church or the God of the church. But as time goes on, there will be blood because these powers, if you don't service them well, they start to fight and destroy everything it has built. So you will find that there are churches where people are fighting, there's division, there's, there's this up and down. It is because of you are no longer using the right methods to maintain this power. Now this power is fighting its own. Everything that the power has accumulated, it has to be destroyed, attacked by this kind of power. So once the cult leader dies without initiating a follower, it becomes a problem. People die. People kill each other. There is a division. Whether you try to talk about it, there can never be a union because the issue is the powers. Thank you. Thank you so much, Apostle. Um, uh, I want to ask a few questions. Um, very instructive indeed. The purpose is a conversation. Let's get the nation talking. Do we understand what we are talking about, what we are entered into? My first question also is, what are the dangers associated with these practices, especially for social cohesion and nation building in our country? And what are the risk, risks for a national um, uh, sovereignty, so to speak, national security. Because if you have got pockets and pockets of power, would this not militate against a coup against a government of the day? Because you have got pockets of power everywhere and they claim authority. In other words, you have got government within government or society within society. I just want to check, are they dangerous or nothing? Thank you so much, Chair, for these interesting questions. The dangers. Church, churches were built to bring unity. Churches were, were built to restore communities. But these churches, they do the opposite. These churches divide a mother from their kids. These churches divide a husband from the wife. These churches are bringing division in our community rather than unity or national building. Why am I saying this? If you look lately on the media, or if you look on social media, you are able to see the depth of these church members who are able to fight their own family member while they are protecting their spiritual path. So it, it, it shows and it sends a message, not only in a family setting, but also churches are divided. The same churches where we say we are all Christians, but we are divided. We are fighting because others are protecting a human being. We use the same Bible, but interpreting it in different forms. So the danger of these cults or mega churches, it is not every mega church that is part of the cult, but the danger is that they don't build our nation, but they divide the nation. That is what I can say. So the danger is that through their indoctrination or teachings, you are able to, to see division from families, division in communities, division also in, in religion. Because this one, it reminds me in the Bible, where this one says, I am of Paul. So people come and say, I follow a human being, and they are proud to say, I am following this person, while others are saying, I am following.
following Christ. So there is that division. The risk of the national security. In my second book, that is called Initiated by My Spiritual Father, I elaborate more on this because it is so sad that even politicians, they go to this church to acquire power, to get powerful positions in the country or in the world. So once politicians, they go there, we know these politicians as leaders or influential leaders. But once they are there, Mr. Chair and the Commission, the same man that we look up to becomes a child. Because in that environment, you are a child of the spiritual father. So the politician decides to submit just because of spiritual advantage that he's looking for. And what is funny enough is during the one-on-one -on -one consultation, politicians or business people, they go and say, I want to see the prophet. Then the prophet will come and they sit. And where they sit in that room, they are civilians, they are cameras, they are tape recorders that are there. The politician will talk. So, so and so is after my life. He, he talks private things and is being recorded there. And once the politician moves out, then they start the blackmail. And so we've got information about you. You need to do one, two, three for me. So this, this uh, 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 spiritual purpose, they are controlling even the government in the sense that they've got things against our political leaders. And they use it as a black bay. So I can say that the national security, uh, Mr. Chair, is at risk. Because no matter what we can do, these spiritual fathers are able to escape where you have closed the door. And you'll ask yourself, how did you come out? It's because of power, extra power, not spiritual power. They have the spiritual power and they have the political influence. So dealing with them, you are dealing with a deep government within our government. That is the reason why their interage is being ushered by the government cars, policemen. When the pastor goes to church, the policemen, the traffic cops, they usher this person. These people, they've got diplomats, passports. When they go to the airport, is because they've got spiritual powers which they are using against the politicians. So at the end of the day, you find that our government is not only controlled by the parliament, but our government is controlled through an office of a spiritual father who is seated down somewhere else. Thank you so much. Uh, before I give uh, commissioners a word, uh, let me um, continue. Uh, I know the role of the commission. It must be clear to the public. The role of the commission is to protect and promote the rights of cultural, religious, and linguistic communities. And the, the, three, linguist, the three communities give the totality of South African communities. So our aim is to ensure that these communities enjoy their religion, enjoy their worship, undeterred. In other words, as a commission, we are not mandated to close the church. We don't close the church. We want the church to do what the church is supposed to do, or what religion is supposed to do. Um, African religion, Hinduism, whatever, all those religions must do what they're supposed to do. And what they're supposed to do must be in line with the Constitution. And what we're about here is about the Constitution. 
suppose the, the religious behavior was weird, you know. But in that uh, behavior, what is important is to what extent are these behaviors violating the rights of the religious communities, the, uh, the, 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 the human dignity of the people. To what extent? And, and that is for, for us the key, I believe. How to make sure that the religion is a home in which our people find satisfaction in enjoying their worship, enjoying um, their common understanding of the Bible is speaking. Now, what I wanted to find out is in which way, in your view, can we minimize the practices that in the impinge upon the violation of the rights of these communities, the violation of their dignity, and the violation of their freedom of religion, so to speak. What what can be done in your view? Thank you so much. I think what needs to be done is conversation. We need a conversation in the villages, in our community, in the local halls, because bringing a a conversation, not only a, a conversation that brings uh, the churches only, but a conversation that brings everybody, all this religion coming, including the traditional. And we sit down and have this conversation and we allow people to ask questions because these are, remember, it, in this case, it is the pastor who is wrong. It is not the multitude. But the victims are the multitudes. So it means that the multitude has to be educated. And education comes through conversation. We need to talk about this. You know, Mr. Chair, when I came out and tried to talk about my experience, a lot of pastors, they, they fought me. They hated me because they said what you are saying is not something that should not be talked about. But guess what? Since I started to talk about this thing, they have stopped prophesying people using their ID number because I revealed that. So the more we have a conversation and we, we talk about this thing, it will become less because what is hidden, it is now exposed. So if we move and uh, bring a conversation where people, even the victim, they, they are being given a chance, the community, to talk, Mr. Chair, I can say, proudly so and say there are more that you are still going to hear what you have heard last week there are more who are in their houses they are crying and they can't come here but they need that conversation in their community there are older women who have been raped by young men who are called spiritual fathers and others they have even died performing those kind of things so there is more in our community, and the community wants to talk, and they don't know where to talk because I tried to talk. I was silenced by the pastors. They said, no, you can't talk. But I was bold enough and said, I am talking my story here. So we need the commission to go to the people, hear them. And after hearing them, may the commission have a, a, a particular manual where it will give these people on how to identify cult churches, distribute it, and distribute, the, let people understand. We need the art who will come also, perform dramas about this, because other people, they don't hear by, uh, they don't understand by hearing, but they understand by performance. We need dramas on this. We need to come together because this elephant, uh, 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 Mr. Chair, it needs a community to deal with it. Thank you, sir. Thank you so much. Yes. Um, Commissioner Gorta, over to you. I just want to find out um, 
Am I correct in saying that when it comes to the cult, um, we've been told that bloodletting and the sexu sexuality is an extremely important part of the manifestation of the occult because this is what the power requires in, in order to maintain it. And then when it comes to that, is, are these practices restricted to um, religious institutions or those sort of environments or are, are these powers practices uh, practiced in other environments? Um, and how would the, the other environments be able to manifest those things so that we are able to see it as, okay. as individuals? Okay. Thank you so much. I would say these practices, they can also be found in traditional doctors. There are traditional doctors who have went somewhere to acquire extra powers as well. And they use the very same practice which the pastors are using. But in the traditional, it, it is, you can't see it because of they're able to, to tell you and say it's the ancestors who said we must do this. So they, they have a way of manipulating it. So the reason why it is more vocal in the church it is because it's a new thing. We don't understand this. Because the Bible says sex before marriage is sin. So, yet the pastor is practicing that. So, we also have uh, people, business people, who go and acquire extra power. We also have uh, top influential people who've got, who've got houses, big houses. They are not married. And, and this power, uh, the instruction was said, you don't marry. They've got money to pay no more, but they stay alone. So, this is a practice that has been there for some time. It is just that now a lot of religious leaders have decided and have abandoned prayer and acquired this power. So it is killing the church and killing families. But if one person is using for their own personal things, that is something else. But now they are using this to enrich themselves at the expense of their followers. And most of these victims, their lives, if they don't get deliverance, their life become shattered because of they are condemned spiritually, they are hurt emotionally. So when you deal with this, you need to deal with it holistically, which we need professionals, psychologists to come in and be able to counsel these people because a lot of things have been damaged in their, in their lives. Thank you. It's, it's all there. It's, it's, it's 
Chesterton that comes to say, we are in a space where we see this pot all in one, maybe getting lost somewhere. Else. Maybe you can assist us on this. Okay. I'll give you soon. Thank you so much, Commissioner Bele. I will say that uh, this cult, they, they, they mix, as I've said earlier on, that they mix a lot of religious practices. But because we are here in Africa, in South Africa, in an African context, there is a high influence of the African spirituality in these churches. In a sense that in an African religion, they give you muti, which is, it comes from a tree. Now, in these churches, they know they can't give you muti. They'll give you an oil, which comes from the same tree. So just because it is oil that is packaged well, but coming from the same source, it is the same practice. And in this church, they will tell you that because you used to give to your ancestors, now you should give a certain amount of money. It is the same practice. You used to give to your ancestors. You are used to this thing that every year you give a cow to uh, your ancestors. Now you must bring that cow to the man of God. So it is the same practices. And in the African uh, spirituality, you go, you consult. Here, they don't, uh, they call it one on one. It is the same practice. So, Chair, actually here, we are dealing with a modified African religion that is camouflaged as a Christian church. Um, <clears throat> the issue, uh, I think we need to come to the chase, cut it to the chase. Um, CNN is not a police uh, commission for religious practices. We cannot police them. Uh, CRL is only concerned that practices that emanate from religion should not violate the rights and the human dignity of our people. That's the bottom line. It should not turn our people into zombies. Yeah? Should not tell, don't hypnotize them. Don't use practices that uh, would let them um, use their resources without thinking. If they have to think to give resources on their own, we call it voluntary. But the involuntary giving as a result of some kind of uh, practices that accompanies that, we have heard people say, I've been in poverty. Mm -hmm. You can't give beyond your capacity to give. There has to be a limit. So, so, so people must understand the role of the commission. It's not a police person or a police commission of the religious, cultural, and linguistic community. We are seeing each and every religion, culture, linguistic, adhere to the Constitution and its imperative. Anything that does not align to that, it will not make the, this commission happy. And of course, the country will not be happy as well. We don't want to hear the cries of women, children, even men who are under exploitative environment and who have been abused. People come to us. We don't go to communities and invite them. They come here. And religious leaders, when they hear their own members talking about their own suffering, they then blame CRL. As if we have created the problem. We don't create problems. So when they create problems, people will want to get the problem solved. Where do they come? CRL. Now when we deal with the problem, they say, no, CRL is now gaining against us. We, we don't gain against anybody. It is the people who have been violated, who feel aggrieved, who say, CRL, please help us. So we allow people to speak and tell their own story. 
And the aim is to build. The aim is to construct a new society in the context of the new constitution. And we want to promote loyalty to the country, loyalty to its people. That's what our role, our role is all about. Okay? Is there anything? It appears we have had a very good uh, morning with you, uh, Apostle. Thank you so much. Um, I only forgot to ask you how, at least you said something about the initiation. I wanted to check the concoction that they gave you. Did you see what is inside the concoction there? <laughs> 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 I don't know, the concoction, but, but it did work, so it did work for you. Yeah, uh, after I, I have buried the head of the people, <clears throat> without any doing extra program, I saw people flocking to church. Mm. So I can say I saw, yeah, it did work, yeah. Okay. But those people who are flocking to church are not people who are looking for the word of God. Those are people who come for prophecy, prosperity, and other things. Okay. Yes. Well, thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, no, I, I thought I was concluding, but I can see <laughs> that there's more interest, but I can't stop you. I can't stop you. <laughs> yes, uh, uh, Thank you, Chair. I, I just want to check more for how did you manage to get those People were coming to my house from 4 o'clock in the morning, chewing for one-on-one -on -one consultation because this power will attract you. This power gives you fame. It, they, it makes people to, to think that they don't mind traveling and coming to wait at the gate before you can start practicing. So people were flocking at my house from 4 o'clock in the morning. So I was doing one-on-one -on -one there in, in my house, in social movement by then. Now, one morning as I was there, three policemen came. And they said, we are looking for Makabe, they called me by name. And they said, we are looking for you for a mutilation case. Where you, uh, mutilation, it is a practice of dealing with human body parts. Mm -hmm. That was in social movement by then. Now they arrested me and I went to Hoshimampuru prison for that particular case. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was going through trial. What happened is that as I was practicing as a false prophet, people came with human body parts. They came to me and said, we are selling you this so that it can boost you. So that you can be more successful. So I saw them, but I did not buy them. Now, what happened is that when the policemen came, they had a case of a, somebody whose body parts has been uh, chopped off and they arrested the suspects. So they were looking and tracing where the suspects went. So they came to me because the suspect came to me as well. So in that case, I even helped the police people to tell them, these people, they came and they said they wanted to sell me the body parts and I did not buy them. And I showed them where they have hidden these body parts. I took the police people and I showed them. And the police, they found the exhibit. Then after that, what happened is that I was acquitted from the case because they could not find anything that linked me as a buyer from those people. And once I was acquitted from that particular case, I spoke and said, you know what? This is not the life that I want to live. I want to come out of this kind of lifestyle. So that is where my turning around came when I was in prison. I started to say, I am turning around from this. The second thing that happened is that I stopped going to church. I said, I'm stopping and I'm going back home where I need rehabilitation, restoration, and deliverance. And I spoke to my parents and they, they prayed for me. I stayed home for some time. And I said, what I have done, I'm no longer waiting to be a pastor. I said, no, I'm sitting down. I applied for a job. I was a driver, a courier driver. I moved around as a driver. Up until one day as I was driving, the same call came to me and said, this is not the life that I was called you for. 
And I wrote a letter to the Apostolic Faith Mission. And I asked them to come back because that is where I got my training. And the Apostolic Faith Mission gave me a process and said, before we can accept you, you need to go back and serve uh, under one pastor. After you have served, the pastor will monitor you. And once they are satisfied, they will be able to give you the license. I did that part. After I've done that part, after I've served, I was reordained by the church. And after I was reordained by the church, there was a church in Subuke, uh, Zone 10, the AFM. They advertised that they are looking for a pastor. I sent my CV to apply in that church. I went for the interview in that church, and I was appointed to be the pastor in that church. So today as I'm here, I am employed in that church. The gentlemen that I came with, they are the elders of the church. Thank you. Thank you so much. No, uh, thank you so much for, for that history, uh, yeah. Apostle. So it can be done. Yes. We can turn our those that have been caught up yes. into men and women that can serve God once again. Amen. Thank you. Thanks, Jay. Uh, thanks, Moshe. Maybe for me, it's, it's what do we do in terms of the recourse of members that were in your own group now. Now that you, you, you have been restored, rehabilitated, I think you are still going through healing. If, you know, because healing is a process. A process yes. How do we ensure now that the ones that were kept out in your own space that at the time, we heal them because they are in numbers which are still, still seated there suffering the outcome of what you may have at the time, you know, done. How do we strive to ensure that they are better? Yeah. Their minds have came back and they're able to be, you know, to be normal people as they were born. I'm not sure what normality is, but I'll just use that normal. Okay. What I have done when I said that I'm stopping this, I, I closed the church and I spoke to them that uh, I'm no longer a pastor and I advise them to look for a church that preaches the true gospel. Mm. And uh, I did not end there. I approached one national newspaper where I public, uh, publicly apologized. Because part of healing is when you are able to confront your, your mistakes and you say to people, I am sorry for what I've done. And my recommendation is that look for a, a better church. Then others, they look for a better church. We are still in communication. I was telling my wife the other day and said, you know, it, it's so strange that once you, you, you have wronged somebody and they still send you WhatsApp and so we are proud of you, of the work that you are doing to this nation. From hearing such messages from them, it gives me strength. So I did not end there. I, I move around with churches that invite me, trying to bring this awareness. So I think that the best way is when you give a person knowledge. So this is what I've done to share this knowledge so that people's consciousness can know the truth. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, um, uh, Apostle. I think uh, I need to thank you on behalf of the Commission. Because um, <clears throat> the commission uh, thought it necessary to have this kind of uh, conversation um, with the support of SABC, we are reaching South Africans as we talk. We are talking to the nation, and I'm hoping that uh, many will come forward. We need to learn. We need to unlearn the things that may have captured us to become lesser than who we are as South Africans. But a great people and a great nation. And what is happening to us um, cannot define who we are. So it's important that we collectively define this vision and going forward. And thank you so much for coming to us. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair.